And there came a fear on them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up amongst us, and God hath visited his people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we're reminded today again of holy fear. Often we will speak about this first of the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. First, in terms of most foundational, that which we cannot, without which we cannot have the rest. Uh, just like faith, without faith, you can't really have charity, right? So, without fear, we cannot have, you know, the wisdom and, and and the other gifts. So, we tend to talk about that right around the time of Pentecost. But today it comes up again, and it's a reminder to us to pray for this gift of holy fear for an increase in it so that each day we walk in the fear of the lord so that we may persevere in his ways so that in holy fear we may spend our time not servile fear but a holy fear knowing that at any moment we could be taken from this world and just had a reminder of that secular example of there's a a famous hockey player plays for National Hockey League, who died at the age of 31. Him and his brother, who's also a player uh, for the minor leagues. Uh, he was 31, his brother's 29. They were struck by a car, drunk driver, killed on the spot. So whether they were Catholic or not, I don't know. I not, really don't know much about them at all. But as a reminder to us that this type of thing happens all the time, every day. They, we hear about them because they're more famous. But every single day, people die. Many thousands of people die every single day, and one day will be our day. So we need to live in the recognition of that, the realization that God has not promised us tomorrow. We only know that we have today, so that in all of our actions, all of our dealings with others, especially those of the household of the faith, as the scripture says today, that we walk in in a circumspect way, in a way that is realizing that we are in the presence of God and that we're never not in his presence. And that as a result of that, we realize that that heaven is promised to those who persevere. Not to those who start well, but to those who end well. And given that any moment could be our end, we realize that we want this to be that. <laughs> okay, we want it, we want to be in such a way that as if right now I was going to be judged. So, because one t- at one point it will be. So, now, in terms of this holy fear, that could be increased in us via silence before the Blessed Sacrament, respirations, to make known our desire to him for a greater amount of this gift, just as Solomon asked in the Old Testament for holy wisdom and was given a great measure of it. Of course, he did not persevere in it, right? That we be granted more fear in order that we may obtain more charity. Because even though we've said that fear is the beginning of wisdom, not the end of wisdom, the end of wisdom now, obviously being wisdom itself, right? Charity, which is the equivalent of wisdom. Okay? That fear does not decrease as we become holier. As we grow closer to wisdom, holy fear increases because our awe of God increases. As our awe of him increases, our love for him increases as does our holy fear. Okay, so it's not like we begin in fear and end in love. We actually begin in fear and some measure of charity and grow in both. Charity takes the lead eventually, but it does not mean that holy fear goes away. Holy fear is a preservation against mortal sin. Okay which is something we, we never want to lose, right? We never want to lose that fear. Okay. Now, we can pray also that if we're, if we're struggling with obtaining this virtue, 
that God himself wakes us up. You know, this gift of the Holy Ghost, that if, if by some chance we're really low in this gift, that God can give us a jolt, a little scare. Sometimes that's what it takes. Just a little something to, to set us aright. Right. We don't want to wait until the chastisement, the fullness of the chastisement is upon us to have an increase in this gift. Because at that point, it may be for us too late because there might be too much on our conscience at that point. We will see as the chastisement reaches its, its fulfillment that we have very little time, if any, to set our accounts straight. It's just in that moment. And then the weight of our past neglect could crush us. I mean, want to avoid that. So when the chastisement, which we're in now, right, but maybe not to its fullest extent, when we get to that point, obviously we do want the fear of God, right? We do, and we do want to, and it will, we'll recognize it even more, actually, because we'll be in awe of him and we'll know that it's from him, right? So as a result of that, it should help us when that happens, when the chastisement reaches its peak. But if we are not obtaining and growing in that holy fear right now, we're again spending, as we've said before, too much time for ourselves, not enough for God, and we're losing that holy fear, very easy to fall back into mortal sin, but then also for taking by surprise, there's no guarantee. Even if that, in that moment we're in the state of grace, we could despair and lose that state of grace. Okay, so holy fear is very, very important. So let's not forget that. And then an application of that today is that whereas the people were astounded to the point that a holy fear came upon all of them, okay, for us, even the greatest miracles that are done each week, every day at the altar become but commonplace for us. They can have little to no effect. As if the people saw our Lord perform this miracle today and just look at each other and move on as if nothing happened. And yet what happens at the mass is greater than this miracle, this physical miracle. This is a miracle on another level, what happens at the mass. But because we don't see the miracle, because nothing seems to change, the, the bread that's changed into the body and blood of our Lord still looks to be bread. The wine that changes into the body and blood of Christ still tastes like wine. Because of that, it's very easy. Because our senses are deceived, it's too easy for us to take this miracle for granted. And then not approaching in a holy fear, we receive unworthily. Okay. So the preparation for the worthy reception of the sacraments is vitally important, lest we receive the grace of God in vain. Let every man prove his own work, having glory in himself and not in another, as the epistle says. Okay, right? Sowing in the spirit and not in the flesh, for God is not mocked. So it's easy for us to rely upon others at work. Maybe we can get away with more than, than we otherwise could. Maybe could we, cut, we make we have shortcuts, right? We cut corners. Uh, could be for work, could be for school. Maybe we can get away with that to a certain extent. But when it comes to preparation for the sacraments, we cannot get away from it, away with it. Can I get away from it or with it? Right, <laughs> basically both, both work. So uh, we have to do the work. We have to, even if it only takes 30 seconds to 60 seconds, just putting ourselves in the presence of God and saying, this is what's about to happen now. Our Lord is about to become present on the altar. He is going to be here just as much as he was in this miracle today in the gospel. And he already is in the tabernacle, right? So... We try to, in some way, represent to ourselves the mystery of that particular mass in accord with the gospel, or maybe some other mystery of the faith, something that we're drawn to that makes us appreciate more what is happening at the altar. Okay. In this way, we better direct our thoughts in preparation for the reception of Holy Communion. Okay, so we must never neglect this. It doesn't have to take 20 minutes. It can take literally 30 to 60 seconds, just like in a preparation for meditation. It can only take 30 seconds, maybe, just to put yourself in the presence of God, beg his pardon for your past infidelities, and for the grace of whatever in particular you're looking to obtain via the meditation, 
similar with the mass. This is what's about to happen. I beg pardon for my past infidelities. I pray for a greater contrition to be able to make better confessions. And for this mass, I would do my best not to get distracted because I know what's happening here is very important, more important than I most of the time realize. Okay, so that's all we have to do. And if we do that each time, and then we stay a little bit extra after Mass, allowing the grace of the sacrament to sink into our soul so that the, bir- the was the birds they take from the path, right? As one of the, another gospel says, that the seed's on the path and the, the devil takes it, basically. So uh, it just takes a little bit longer just to forcibly keep out distractions and focus on the great gift we're being given here and then making a resolution to make good on it. Okay, so it doesn't have to be overcomplicated or over strenuous, but it just takes persevering effort. That's all. Prayerful meditation, the spirit of meditation brings us face to face with just how big of a moment every sacrament is, especially Holy Communion and confession as well, every single time. So failure to make the necessary persevering effort to receive these sacraments with the requisite faith, devotion, and gratitude will put us in danger of losing the state of grace itself. Because again, God is not mocked, right? God, God, if we are not faithful, if we are not grateful at any moment, he can remove his prevenient grace, it's called, and we can fall into sin. He doesn't have to prevent us from falling into sin. And as we've said numerous times, sometimes he'll allow that, he'll allow himself to be so, so offended to wake us up. So we're talking about waking up in order to to gain holy fear. Let it not be mortal sin that does that. Maybe something else we could pray for to help us to strengthen us in in this this disposition. Okay. So do not rush into the sacraments without approaching Christ with a similar helpless, this basically completely dependent upon our Lord disposition as the mother in the gospel had today, every single time. God will reward reward us, excuse me, more than he did even this woman today. Okay. And then also Christ oftentimes would foreshadow his death and resurrection. Destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Well, today in this man and the widow, right? The mother's a widow, it's representative of him and of Our Lady of Sorrows. Oftentimes, this gospel will coincide with very some right around the time of Lady of Sorrows, just two weeks away now. So we have our Lord who is dead. He brings himself back to life. In this case, he's bringing this man back to life, bringing joy to the widow who is his mother. And just foreshadowing the fact that she would be in great sorrow, he would be dead, but then he would rise again by his own power and then bring to her great consolation. Okay. Then also the church today is a representative of the sorrow that she has over her dead children, those who are dead in mortal sin. Okay, so church mourns for these children, prays for them in the hope of bringing them back to life by a good confession. Okay, much of the city were with her today. So that's representative of the holy religious and faithful whose prayers and sacrifices assist the church to obtain such a great grace. Because this man doesn't just represent our Lord, he also represents one who's dead in mortal sin. So it's like, oh, the church is there with the woman, our lady of sorrows, looking to bring this man back to life. So that is, when we're praying for our, our loved ones who are fallen away, we are like those going in procession today. Okay, we all know them and we must not judge them but pray for them, obtain the grace for them. That is what the church requires of us. Okay, so we have to know, we have to be confident that no matter how far away one may seem to be, that repentance is always possible. Uh, And remember St. Therese of Lisieux, we may have used this example before, certainly talked about it before, where there was somebody, a hardened criminal, going to the scaffold. He refused a priest. She prayed for him. He kissed the crucifix before he died because of her prayer. That's what happens when you're holy. So let's be holy, right? If we're not holy, 
then we're probably not going to obtain many graces for people, right? But if we are holy, the sky's the limit. St. Therese got anything she asked for. All I have to do is read about her life. Even when she didn't, she did. <laughs> so she turned it into something that was a gift for her, right? Even when it seemed like it was not. So let us be like St. Therese. It's still about a month before her feast day, but she's always appropriate to talk about. She's a saint for our times. And she has such great confidence, such great love for God that she never despaired of his help for herself or for her family. Remember we talked about Leone. She prayed for Leone, her older sister, who was a bit of a pill, right? Very difficult. And she is, she died, we presume, we, we, it seems in the odor of sanctity. So we should never despair of those who have fallen away or being very foolish right now. They may drive us. I don't want to be too quick wheel here, but a little uh, crazy, right? But remember that God is allowing that for his purpose. And if nothing else, for our mortification, for our strengthening, for our perseverance. Because by our perseveringly praying for their soul, just as Monica who prayed for St. Augustine, whose feast we just celebrated this past week, she became holier as a result of that. Of course, his conversion was obtained, but even if it was not, she would have been holier. She would have had a greater place in heaven for her efforts. Whether, whether or not they worked for him, they would have worked for somebody, right? So we remember that even when it seems like our prayers are not working, they are working, even if we do not see exactly the effect of those prayers. And then it was Dom Garanger as a reminder. I said this a year ago, I wanted to use this quote again because it's a very good one. In an excerpt from his Reflections for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost, reminds us of the spirit of these obligations we have towards Holy Mother Church, regardless of the outcome, right? He says, it is the duty of us Christians to share in the anguish of our mother, the church. We surely can never be satisfied with not being of the number of those senseless sons who are a sorrow to their mother and despise the labor that bore them. The thought of what our birth cost her should force us to do everything that lies in our power to comfort her, to comfort our dear mother Mary as well. She is the dear bride of the incarnate word and our souls too aspire to union with him. Let us prove that such union is really ours by doing as the church does by showing in our acts the one thought, the one love which the divine spouse always imparts to souls that enjoy holy intimacy with him. Because there is nothing he himself has so much at heart, the thought of bringing the whole world to give glory to his eternal father, love procuring salvation for sinners. So to possess the mind of the church, we must not only be devout, but devoted to her cause. It does not stop at the doors of the church, it starts here. Ite misa est. Okay, so as part of our mission, as a part of our identity to anguish with Holy Mother Church. We're not to cause the church anguish by our sins, but to remove them by our anguish with her. Okay, so we remove the thorns in the sacred heart. We remove the effects. Well, God removes the, the effects through the intercession of our Blessed Mother by our cooperation with God's grace in our prayers and our sacrifices for our loved ones who have fallen away. So never despair, even if it seems to be years, decades, we just keep doing what we're doing, just like we pray for the dead. We don't stop praying for the dead. Oh, they're probably in heaven now, right? We pray for them until the day we die, right? Always we pray for them. We don't stop. Similar with those who are still living. Even more for those who are still living because there's still a chance they, they'll be damned and there's also so much for them to obtain, whereas the souls in purgatory, they obtain, but they, they don't grow. They just obtain our, uh, some relief, right? So, okay. As part of our work in the field, common image in scripture of the world, we need to learn how to mourn with Holy Mother Church, giving her comfort and obtaining conversions. We begin with holy fear and continue with good sacramental preparation. That's the part that we need to do for ourselves then and only then can we truly behold the image of the mother and the dead son today. Okay, so again, as Dom Garanger compares to the church. The tears that we shed both for our sins and for the sins of others is like that water that restores a plant or the soul to its original torgor. 
that makes it stand aright again. The counsel we give erring souls is like the sun giving illumination and warmth to the plant, pointing it again in the right direction. The opposition we show to those harming society, both inside and outside of the church, is like pulling up the weeds, removing the big stones, destroying the bugs, threatening to overrun the field. Okay. Each of us today has our part to play and will answer for the part we choose to play. We will only know on the last day how many souls in the field have been saved or lost, including our own, as a result of our decisions. So we pray today for that holy fear that will begin to make this a reality for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.